as entrepreneurs, we want to make a difference. And we are passionate about what we're doing. We want to communicate. We want to help solve problems. But sometimes the marketplace makes it more challenging. How do we rise above the challenges where so many companies that you know, get caught up in the dis disruption of the marketplace and not only do they not thrive, but they don't survive? Well, I have a extremely talented entrepreneur, Peter Legg, who's gonna be joining us. And Peter is in one of the toughest industries in the world, the media. It's seen so much changes. And he's taken that and rose in above and really providing some tremendous services. And what I'd like him to do is to share with us the lessons learned. These are going to be very powerful ones. So no matter what business you're in, you can put them to action and make a huge difference in accelerating your success. I'm John Bowen. We're at AESNation.com. Stay tuned. You will be ready to take action. Ordinary success? No way. You want amazing, remarkable, exceptional breakthroughs. Dig deep, think bold, drive hard, watch yourself soar beyond your dreams. AESNation.com. Peter, thank you for joining us today. I, I really appreciate you making the time, your busy schedule. I mean, you've got an awful lot of things going on and and you're here to help our fellow entrepreneurs even be more successful. Well, thank you, John. I'm honored to be here. Am I your first Canadian that you've interviewed? Uh, no, but you're there. It's a small list. I, I, I had a, a business in 1998 that I sold uh, financial service on a couple billion dollar management firm to a Canadian firm. So I, I have one based in Winnipeg. So I have a lot of Canadian friends now and, uh, uh, it's been, you know, it's amazing. And that's one of the things we probably should talk about too, Peter, as we get into this. But, the, you know, the cross border, I mean, the, you know, for so many entrepreneurs, there's opportunities on both sides. But, P Peter, we were introduced by a, a good friend of mine, Bill Backrack, who's one of the top uh, coaches in financial services as well. And he uh, is uh, one of the top speakers. And he goes, John, you got to meet Peter. And I'm so glad he introduced us because, I mean, you've, you've done some amazing things. And I, I want to, before we go into kind of life lessons learned and how your fellow entrepreneurs can apply them, Peter, what I'd love to do is take a step back and, you know, how did you, you know, really accomplish all that you've accomplished? I mean, where did it start? You know, people don't usually wake up at, you know, 12 and say, I'm going to create a media empire and go out and communicate and help people be even more successful. How did this come together? Well, I was working in a radio station uh, just outside of Vancouver and about 45 years ago, and the station manager and I weren't really getting along, and so he fired me. Now, I'm not the first guy to get fired. I'm not the only guy to get fired, but nevertheless, uh, you felt, uh, I felt as low as a snake's belly. And I went home and in my despair, I had a, a young wife and a six month old baby. And I was watching the movie Gone with the Wind. And about halfway through the movie, I, I think actually that's probably one of the best movies ever, certainly in the top 10. And about halfway through the movie, and you would remember this Ron, uh, John, uh, it, it, Scarlett O'Hara is whipping a horse and buggy back to terror and the sun is setting behind her, and the horse collapses and dies, and she jumps out of her cot, and she falls to her knees, and she said, as God is my witness, I will never go hungry again. Well, that scene has resonated with me virtually every day for some 45 years. And I say to my audiences, she actually spoke to me. Now, well, she really didn't, but that scene spoke to me, and what it said was, so you got fired, big deal. You're not the only person to get fired, don't worry about it. Go upstairs, take a shower, shine your shoes, put on a clean shirt and tie, and go out there and make something of your life. That's what I did. But I had no idea what I was going to do. Well, you know, well and it's, it's so amazing. I mean, you know, it's usually out of these 
tough moments, you know, we get, uh, we get fired. And, you know, the, the opportunity there to grow is just so amazing. So many of us have had challenges. Uh, and, you know, it's one door closes, one opens. I mean, getting fired uh, is never anything pleasurable <laughs> for any of us. And very few people uh, get through life unscarred. And it's, it's how we get up. And, you know, you were inspired by Scarlet at uh, Gone with the Wind. And, you know, I, I think that's... You know, that standard, I mean, that was an inspiring movie. And take me to, though, you know, so you're, you're not going to go hungry anymore. Well, you've, you've done more than that. You've helped an awful lot of people really have success. And, you know, how did that come together? Well, the first magazine that was being published by a radio sports uh, announcer who had an arrangement with the printer that if he couldn't pay the bill at any given time, they could seize the title. Well, he was a much better radio broadcast than he was businessman, so he couldn't pay, they seized the title. But they didn't want to be the publishers, they just wanted to print the magazine. He left them with a debt of $72,000. So as the aspiring entrepreneur, I went to the owner of the, uh, the uh, printing plant. I said, you've got a bad debt of $72,000 that you're not going to uh, collect. Move it to an accounts receivable, and I will guarantee that accounts receivable. And what I want for that is the magazine. But you get to do the printing. That simple, Simon, is how I ended up with TV Week magazine, which we still publish today, some 45 years uh, later. And it probably is the one of the highest grossing magazines that we've got no. so that's how i got my first magazine well and 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 it was a leveraged buyout if you will because there was no capital at the time that you had is that correct that's i didn't have 72 cents <laughs> yeah but i i convinced the the owner of the the printing plan that i would pay that money out of uh, future profits over a couple of year period i paid it in the first year yeah no and this is I mean, this is one of the things I want all of us as entrepreneurs to think about is, you know, there's disruption in the marketplace, you know, always. I mean, that was 45 years ago. There's disruption today. To the extent that we can be prepared and be opportunistic, boy, you know, we, we can really expand our businesses and serve people well. Now, well, let, well, let me just add to that, John. Yes. A few years later, there was another magazine came available called Award Magazine which was for the construction architect business in Western Canada. And so the, the chap phones me and he says, I'm in real trouble, can you help me? He couldn't pay his printing bill and the printer, different printer, was going to seize his house because he had put his house up as security. Mm -hmm. I said, well, we can't have that happen. Give me a couple of days. So I went to the printer, I said, look, you're gonna own this guy's house, put him out of business, you really don't want his house, you're in the printing business. I tell you what, I'll guarantee you the printing for 15 years. You let him have his house and I'll buy the magazine. And you forgive his debt indebtedness. So he did. So I bought the magazine for a dollar. We still <laughs> have that magazine 35 years later and it's one of our high, uh, high grossing magazines. But this guy walked away with his house and the printer had a 15-year printing contract, which we paid. That cost me a dollar. But it took some imagination and some creativity to put that deal together. Well, and I, I think, Peter, I think that uh, th this is one that, I mean, that's a, you know, the first one, great, you rose to the occasion. Uh, second one, you're now an expert. And uh, you really, this is, it's not only your clients, you know, as you're showing, that you need to understand their needs, but the strategic partners, you know, and if you're buying a business, what do they need? And it's oftentimes, it's not the money itself. We get caught up with, you know, what's the purchase price? What, what is the deal? Here, you know, the, you know, certainly the individual doesn't want to lose his home. It's important to him. And you were able to find out from the printer what they, he wanted and what the the owner of the magazine wanted and, and bring it together pretty quickly. That's a, you know, a great story. When I, when I was, uh, before I owned my own business, I was in the radio business as a, as a radio salesman. 
And I had an account here in Vancouver, Canada, called Fields Department Store. The guy that owned Fields Department Store was a chap by the name of Joe Siegel. Very tough business guy. I went to see him and I was trying to sell him the 8 o'clock news or the 810 sportscast or uh, rotation of, of, of spots, whatever it was. He said, no, no, I'm not going to buy that. Come back and see me next month. So I'd come back the next month. He still wouldn't buy it. He said, come back next month. He made me do that for six months. And during this period of six months, he would say to me, you know, Peter, you're a good salesman, but I'm not buying. So at the end of the six months, I said to him, you, you call me a good salesman, but you're not buying. Can I ask you why? He said, yes, you're trying to sell me what you want to sell me. You haven't once asked me what my needs are. Now, for a young guy, that was a great lesson, which I still apply today. So I ask you, what are your needs, John? What are you trying to do with your business in the community? And then I see if I can match that up with what I have to offer, what I have to sell. Right. What are you? And, you know, that's a, I think that's going to be a timeless lesson, Peter, that uh, so many of us as entrepreneurs, we, we get so excited about what we're doing. We want to, you know, really share it with the world. We're going to sell it and so on. And we don't take the time to listen to our clients. And the marketplace is just so great at telling us what we should be doing. Uh, and, and but we got to listen. And one of the things you're, you're known for is your ability to you know weather these storms. I mean, you know, the media, there's been all kinds of challenges uh, along the way. And you've been able to really, you know, grow the business and really be sales focused. I mean, tell, tell us some of the lessons you've learned in doing that, that that will help our fellow entrepreneurs. Well, in my experience, John, almost almost every client will tell you what their needs are and they will tell you how to sell them if you're listening. And so somewhere in the conversation, let's say you've got basically 20 minutes with a client and you get down to, say, a price point. Let's say the price point's $15,000. And he says, no, I'm not going to buy it. I'm not going to spend $15,000 with you, or whatever the amount is. It could be $150,000. Then you have to say gently why. You have to find out why, because you have worked it out that he really wants what you're selling, but he doesn't have the $15,000. And he'll say, well, it's $5,000 too much. Well, then you feed back to him saying, so what you're telling me, John, is that you'd buy this for $10,000 if I could sell it to you for $10,000. If he says no, then it's something else. If he says yes, then you have to decide, can you sell that widget, those products, for $10,000? I probably use that almost on a daily basis, whatever the issue is. No, and, and, and no, it's, I don't like one of your writers, so why are you telling me you'd advertise in my <laughs> magazine if I fired that writer? Well, no, that's not what I'm saying. So it's got to be something else. So you've got to find out what that something else is. You've got to find out what that trigger point is for that person to do business with you and engage in, in your, with, you, with you. What I love, Peter, is what you, getting clarity right from the beginning of you know, what their, their challenges are, you know, what, are, what are their needs, what are their concerns, and then whether you have the tools in your arsenal to help them solve that. And then as you're progressing through, okay, now that we, we know we can match this up, you know, price points to move to the next step to be able to put it in action and just that, you know, clarity on the price points because we'll, oftentimes we'll hear objections and a lot of times we just think it's price. And, you know, a lot of times it's not price, it's something else, you know, or we'll think it's exactly. the writer. And, you know, and I, I, I love that idea of, you know, just, okay, well, if they weren't here, you know, would we move forward? Because, you know, I want to be of service to you. That's powerful. This, this, this is a, it's not a rude story, but it is a true story. I was speaking at the University of British Columbia, which is a, a great institution here in, in Vancouver and one of the great universities in our country. And I was speaking to about four or 500 uh, students and one of the topics was sales. And I said, I can get anybody to say yes to anything. 
because unless you're getting your client, unless you're getting whomever you're trying to do business with to nod yes, to say yes in agreement, you're not going to go very far with that client. Well, there was a, an attractive young lady stood up and said, oh, Mr. Legg, this is what I heard you say. You can get anybody to say yes. And I thought, oh, do I really need to be taken on 400 university students? <laughs> I said, yeah, I can do that. So she said, okay, I'll bet you, you can't get me to say yes, I'll go to bed with you. The entire class laughed. They, they thought to themselves, he's got her. I said, okay, the only rule of this game is you can't just say no for the sake of saying no. It has to be a logical discussion. She said, okay. So here's what I said. I said, if you were married to me, would you go to bed with me? Yes. <laughs> I said, that's what I said I get you to do. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, so much of life is about framing, is, you know, really understanding, you know, getting clarity on the issues, framing the discussion so that you can solve the challenges that they have. And uh, yeah. you've done that well. Like, as you say, everybody, every client, whether it's in the speaking business or they're going to buy some books or they're going to uh, buy a speech or they're going to buy uh, pages of advertising or some kind of program, all have issues, all have problems, all have uh, situations they're trying to solve. And you're in front of them and you need to try and help them solve those issues together. Peter, what are you seeing when you're, you know, both from the business and, you know, also, so everyone know, maybe describe, you, you do a lot of, I don't know if a lot is the right word, but I know you are a professional speaker as well as uh, you know, one of the top uh, people in media in Canada and North America. Uh, what, what caused you to go out and communicate like that? Because you know, you, you, you'll see certainly you know, CEOs of businesses go out and do a talk now and again. But as I understand, you're out on the platform a lot uh, communicating. Yeah, I, I'm out there about uh, 40 or 50, 50 times a year. Uh, primarily in Canada, and uh, I love it. And how it started, John, was people would just phone me and say, could you come and tell us how you do what you do? So I said, sure. I wasn't getting paid. And then somebody said, well, could you speak at my car dealer annual meeting next month? I'll pay you $50. I said, you get paid for this? <laughs> and the bug really... Uh, hit me and I thought I really like this and I think people are responding to what I'm saying because they can relate to I'm just an ordinary guy with a wonderful wife and three kids trying to do something in my community and it happens to be in the sales business in the media business and how can I help you as a car dealership or how can I help you as a credit union or how can I help you as a restaurant and if you come along that way it's amazing what can grow. So I got bit by the bug, and so I joined the National Speakers Association in the United States and went to uh, several of their conventions, saw some great speakers, and I thought to myself, I could do that. I can learn to do that. And so I, saw, I, I spoke about 400 times for free to learn how to be a speaker, how to frame my thoughts, how to frame my points, how to engage an audience, how to build up a speech to about an hour. And so I've been doing that for probably 30 years or so. Now, so that's how I got in the speaking business. And now, Peter, do you, does that complement your media business as well, or are they totally separate, or how does that work? Well, they're, they're, they're a bit of the same. Some, some engagements are just professional engagements booked by a bureau. Mm -hmm. I'm going to speak in Winnipeg or Toronto. They pay the fee and they want you to speak on a certain subject. Very often, I've picked up some magazines as a result of speaking to an association or an organization uh, about their industry. And then I find out, well, they've got a magazine that somebody's trying to publish on the side of their desk and they're doing a terrible job of it. And I say, well, I can do that for you through my company and I can speak for you. And they like that. And so it's a win-win situation for, for both people. 
No, so it, that, it works both ways. What I like about it, is, and this is one that I've seen in my businesses too. I, I got acquired by a Canadian firm, as we mentioned, and it came from a combination. I wrote a book and gave some speeches, and the person uh, who wanted to acquire us uh, called because of that, and he wouldn't have known me otherwise. And just, and then I, I was involved in a, a number of acquisitions after that that I was a, a principal to through this and and this is one of the things that you know as we're looking to drive top line revenue uh you've got to be out there and if you can be out there on a platform and you not only have a excuse me authority like you have but it's that celebrity part of being on stage uh that really makes it uh, you know i found it made a difference i don't know peter did you find that too yeah i i know you, you you can't be a speaker. You, you and I can't do what we do without a pretty healthy ego. Um, because you, you, if you're going to go out and, and talk to four or 500 people, you need to be confident in your message and in your ability to deliver what the client wants. But I agree with you. If you look at an audience of 500 people, 99% of them would be scared stiff to even attempt to do what you do and would never do it. So you're set uh, apart and you're unique because you're actually up there. And they look at you differently because you're a professional speaker. And if you happen to do it well and people like what you do, it can open so many doors uh, that uh, a non-speaker could not possibly open. No, I, I totally agree. And I think as our fellow entrepreneurs, one of the things I would encourage you to think about is would that make sense for you, whether you do it you know, like I'm doing it here today with Peter, we're, we're, we're basically you know, sharing a conversation with several thousand of our friends uh, through AESNation.com, a podcast, webinars, or live events. The, the best thing about live events I like is that, you know, that opportunity to oftentimes have the conversation in the back of the room with the person that's not doing the, the association magazine or you know somebody that needs you that they see you after the event and, and there's so much networking but you can get that message out and, and and Peter my guess is you've used it many times to help your clients too I mean you've got you know with the various media properties you have you know they're going to need speakers they're going to need people to champion their side and so on and having that speaking ability is just you know really made you help it moved you from being differential to being distinctive you're 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 a unique individual that people want to be around yeah and that's that's a very good point john there's two two points i'd like to make on that every year in vancouver the salvation army about the first wednesday in in december in fact it was just a week or so ago have an event called hope in the city and we attract about 1,000 or 1,100 people. And so I get to MC that, and I've been doing that for 13 years, and I get to do a hope message. So the question, and I do it for nothing, because I do it for the Salvation Army, and all the audience is made up of business leaders in the marketplace. And so do you think there's somebody sitting down there saying, I'd like what Peter said today, I think maybe I could book him at my convention in Whistler in April. And so out of that, you get two or three bookings. Not that you're doing it for that reason. You're doing it really to serve the community. But if you do it properly, that's what happens. The other thing that I have done for, uh, well, actually, this is my uh, 40th year coming up, is a telethon every year that goes throughout the entire province. It has about a million people viewing it. And we raise money, millions of dollars, for needy kids. I do that for free. But there's somebody in Edmonton, there's somebody in Prince George, there's somebody in Victoria that see me do that every year. They say, I think I could have Peter speak at my conference next week, next month, next year. So by giving back to the community, uh, it's amazing what you will benefit out of that by by serving the community. No, it's, I mean, that's what I love about being an entrepreneur is, you know, by delivering value in many forms, you know, we get uh, really paid disproportionately well. You know, Peter, yes. I, I want to change this for a second. Let's go to a new segment, uh, the book of the day. And Peter, 
um, t- tell me you know, what you're reading or what you've read that you would really resonate with our entrepreneurial audience that you think would help inspire them to even more success. Well, I, I love Napoleon Hill. Uh, I've read virtually every book uh, by John Maxwell on leadership. Uh, he is absolutely the guru on leadership. I would think for the purpose of this interview with you that uh, in 1958, this is before he actually put this in a book, uh, Nightingale um, came to the position where he recorded an album way back in 1958 that uh, uh, was the only album ever produced in those days, an audio album, Mm -hmm. and sold over a million copies. And the album was called The Stranger's Secret. And Earl Nightingale came on and said, if you took a hundred men, way back then he just said men, today you couldn't say that, you have to say men and women, but way back in 1958, if you took a hundred men at 25 and tracked them till 65, one of them would be financially independent, four of them would be doing quite well, but 54 of them would be flat broke. How is that possible in the United States and Canada, the two wealthiest entrepreneurial uh, company uh, countries in the world has ever known how is that possible and for him the strangest secret was that you become what you think about most of the time you become what you think about most of the time and if we're honest with each other and we tracked our uh, history we tracked our successes and we tracked our failures it is primarily because of our thinking You become what you think about. So if you think about being successful, if you think about serving the community, if you think about adding to your client, if you think about doing more for your client than any other salesman does, it's amazing what you can accomplish. So those statistics and that quote by Earl Nightingale has has resonated with me way back since 1958. And just a couple of years ago, it put it in a very small book called The Stranger's Secret. Yeah, and, and definitely I would encourage people to go ahead and download this uh, book. I mean, it's a, it's, it, it really, you know, it's so many of life's lessons. You know, we, we get caught up in having the, the most recent uh, knowledge of you know, research and so on. But human behavior really hasn't changed that much. And, and, and some of the secrets that were known back then are even more applicable now, particularly with all the noise. Let, let me go to the next segment. And this is resources. And what I want to do is I want to pull up a couple of things. One, Peter, what I'd like to do is pull up. I might just flash so everybody has it and we'll put the link on it. You know, they, they were wondering about your company and uh, the Canada-wide media uh, uh, limited and uh, I've got the brand page but you can check out and you, know, you can see the publications that uh, Peter has uh, with his team and, and it's pretty amazing but Peter what I'd like to do is have you comment on your home page you know, more you as a speaker because you've got a bunch of resources there as well so are you showing the one uh, where I'm, I'm speaking John the, the speaking yes. demo yeah uh, uh, well it's flashing the screen now so uh, it's going through a number, uh, but it's Peter Leg, uh, Legge.com. And it shows you speaking best companies for work in P, uh, BC 2011. And I think it does have the video as well. And, and certainly you can go to the keynote address and the different publications and about you. Well, so, some of those events like the BC Business Top 100, uh, which we do uh, every every July. We have about 1,300 people. Uh, I interview a billionaire. Uh, that the almost everyone in the room would know. They might be millionaires. They could, there's obviously more millionaires than billionaires, but millionaires want to be billionaires. And so the questions I ask these billionaires is really the kinds of questions you're asking me, how did you get there? What did you do? What did you learn? What was your biggest success? What was your biggest disappointment? What what surprised you the most? 
And so 1,300 people pay $150 for me to interview uh, whomever this billionaire is. Uh, we do that once a year. We have uh, a 30 under 30 event. The th uh, you have to be under 30 years old, the top 30 people in British Columbia, under 30, who are entrepreneurs, uh, who are striving to build their businesses to be millionaires, multimillionaires, and billionaires. So we do a lot of those events uh, as part of, of Canada Wide. No, that's great. And, and let me go to kind of the final section here where what it's called key takeaways. And what I want to do, Peter, is that you know, I've taken a bunch of notes from the lessons that we've learned. And let me kind of go through. I mean, the, 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 the very first thing, you know, in your story, and it's an inspiring story of, you know, getting fired and being opportunistic and building really a, a, a great media company as well as, you know, leveraging it in such a way to deliver more value to your clients. And then that inspired you to even get the message out with you speaking. And you've built a, you know, a great professional life. And but it's you rewritten it several times. And when I, the number one thing is that we get the ability to rewrite our lives, uh, a new chapter. And, you know, no one gets out of life unscarred. It's uh, nobody goes perfectly straight up. And, you know, maybe on media stories on occasion, it'll appear that way, but everybody has challenges and the opportunities to do that. Second, that the most important thing is to listen to our clients, solve their challenges and drive top line to be very sales driven. And you've been able to, in one of the most challenging times for media, uh, you've shared with me that you, you know, have done it where you've never lost money. And there's very few media companies that can say that. You know, there have been some lean years, but you've really made a lot of success. And then third, and you, you, you kind of touched on this, and, and I think this is just so important, is that there are so many research, resources out there. And, you know, I've got all these books behind me. You're a big reader, both of us. You read roughly a book a week, and and you want to expose yourself not only to your own industry, but to the you know the the rest of the world, what's working, what's not, and you know it's a, the strangest secret. Looking back on some of the best books in the world in the past, as well as in current, taking those, you can really make a difference. Peter, I, I want to thank you for your time today. I mean, it's been really inspiring. Uh, I want to encourage you to continue to make the difference because you're making a difference not only in your own business, not only in your own family, but certainly the community, your clients, and, and, and now with our uh, listeners. Remember that you can get the show notes, the transcript, uh, all the links that Peter and I have talked about at AESNation.com. And with that, it's so important to take the actions that we've talked about and put them in place in your business. Your current clients, your future clients, they're counting on you. Don't let them down. Wish you the best of success. Thanks, John. Exceptional, remarkable breakthroughs. AESNation.com.